welcome to the Kemetic How-To Guide, an educational channel for Egyptian and Kemetic pagans and for anyone else interested in Egyptian religion, because I get a lot of different people and um, in a future episode I'm going to be answering a few viewer questions and comments, hopefully. But today we're going to be looking at Gods of Egypt. Um, I went to see it uh, a few days ago and one thing I have to observe right off had this movie come out about one year ago, uh, the reviews for it probably would have been a lot kinder. Because from early 2015 until now, we kind of reached a critical mass of over-tanked, over-CGI'd action movies, uh, most notably uh, Jurassic World and Terminator Genesis. Terminator Genesis tanked. I, I didn't even get to see it in the theater, but uh, I heard it was bad. Um, if you consider this, we, we first heard about Gods of Egypt, it was a go, it was greenlit uh, back in 2014, and at that point in time, nobody knew what was you know going to, to pan out the next year. Another thing that happened in 2015, we had two movies uh, being Mad Max Fury Road and then Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, which championed a return to practical effects, uh, more limited CGI, and you know good characterization. Um, that's something else we'll get into in a minute. If you consider, though, what it takes to make a movie, it takes a couple of years. And so by the time of uh, summer 2015, all this stuff was starting to unfold. And then, of course, you know, December, um, when episode 7 came out, um, they were already done with the principal photography and everything else for Gods of Egypt. They were working on all that CGI, which we'll talk about in a minute. And also, we had seen uh, Exodus, Gods and Kings, and seen just how lame whitewashing really looks. Christian Bale is Moses? Come on. Uh, by the way, uh, John Oliver has a wonderful bit on Hollywood whitewashing. Look it up on YouTube. It's really fun. Anyway, so by late 2015, it's entirely possible that the folks working on Gods of Egypt were aware of some of these problems that were brewing. But uh, I'm sure the director, Alex Proyas, um, realized they were at a point of no return and maybe thought back to an earlier movie of his. There ain't no coming back. This is the really real one. There ain't no coming back. Now, I have to say, I loved The Crow. Uh, when, <laughs> when I was a teenager, I had two posters for it. My roommate at the time totally had the hots for the head bad guy. Um, you know, it was a great movie, and when I heard that Alex Proyas, the director of The Crow, was going to be doing Gods of Egypt, I was thinking, hey, you know, this was one of the most iconic movies of the 1990s. Surely the director behind this could do something interesting and visionary and, and uh, uh, avant-garde for Gods of Egypt, right? No. No, he couldn't. So... Let's see what's wrong with this movie and maybe a few tidbits that they accidentally kind of got right. I'm going to break it down into cast, visuals, and the plot. So to start with the cast, and I'm going to start with set. Gerard Butler. Really? I, I find myself wondering, did he even bother to take a shower and get out of costume between the end of 300 and Gods of Egypt. Because if you look at his character in Gods of Egypt, it doesn't look like he did a damn thing. Um, I can't tell you how many points I saw him in Gods of Egypt, looked over at my husband and said, TONIGHT WE DINE IN HELL! I'm thinking Arby's. Um, so, and, and the Scottish accent kept coming through and I'm just like, really? So, Having seen the movie, I can offer a possible alternative who I would cast, especially to address the legitimate concerns that uh, uh, there was hardly anyone ethnic in this movie, except for two people. I'll get to them in a minute. I say that a better choice for set would have been Wesley Snipes, because he's played terrific villains and action stars. If you think of Blade, uh, you think of uh, the villain in Demolition Man. Um, I think he has the charisma for it. Not only that, Wesley Snipes has an interest in Egyptian mythology. He has a son named Akhenaten and a daughter named Iset. I think he would be really interested in doing a role in a movie about Egyptian mythology. But, anyway, the next really, really, 
bad pick was Horace. Nikolai Kastar. You know, I'm not even going to try to say his name. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. I don't watch Game of Thrones, but I'm just going to say Jamie Lannister from Game of Thrones. And he should have stayed in Game of Thrones because as Horace, I, I just wasn't feeling him. Really, you know, we were hoping against hope that uh, if they'd cast a blondie, uh, a Scandinavian, as Horace, maybe he was going to spend most of the movie covered in CGI. Um, that would have been an improvement, unfortunately. But what I would have done had this been me playing armchair casting director, I would have gone for an unknown. And that's the problem. You don't have people willing to take a risk and go for unknown actors anymore. Used to be that that's how you got a lot of really cool people. Keep in mind, the first Star Wars movie was a cast of mostly unknowns. Nobody knew who the heck Harrison Ford was before then. Another good example of a movie that uh, brought an unknown to the fore would be uh, Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood and uh, the world's first taste of uh, a very talented actor and director in his own right, Mario Van Peebles. He's the one who eventually brought us New Jack City, which was another great film for Wesley Snipes, and so you have your Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Ra, uh, in Gods of Egypt, the gentleman they had as Ra was okay. The way they portrayed him was okay, but it could have been better. And uh, I have to cre credit my husband with this suggestion for uh, an alternative, a better Ra, would have been James Earl Jones. Because, especially thinking about that with that wonderful voice of his, uh, there were some lines that Ra had in Gods of Egypt that were pretty good, but if you could imagine in James Earl Jones's rich baritone, you, know, you will never destroy what I have created, try as you might. That would have sounded really cool. And he has the, the right gravitas for it. Um, think about it, uh, he was Thulsa Doom in Conan the Barbarian, and the fun irony of that is he would go from leader of a snake cult to a deity who destroys an evil snake every night. That was, you know, another great opportunity missed. And um, our human sidekick in Gods of Egypt, one review kind of suggested that he was a great value Orlando Bloom, and I'm inclined to agree. Um, he introduced himself to Horace um, and said his name was Beck, and I look over at my husband and I said, I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill and you know what? That makes two 90s references in one episode. On that basis alone, I'm flunking this movie. But I would have proposed instead that they cast Rami Malek, who played an Egyptian in Night at the Museum 2, and here's the novel part. He really is an Egyptian! Wow! An Egyptian actor playing an Egyptian! Who would have thought? So, you know... They could have done a lot better with the casting. One thing I will say, uh, Toth, or uh, Jehuti to many of us, was uh, actually pretty well cast. Ethnicity, you know, aside, he gave a great performance. Had he been in a few more scenes, he would have stole the show. And actually, I think Hathor had the right look. Um, you know, uh, she had the dark hair and features, and, you know, she had the right vibe. I thought she was... You know, she gave a really good performance. Um, and I think if you'd had a more diverse cast overall, then Toth wouldn't have looked so much like a token. And it was a real shame that that happened to him because it was a really great performance. Now, visuals. Okay, way too much CGI. It sucked. Uh, we need to get past this now. Uh, one other gripe that I had, a really big gripe, so the costumes for this movie were anything but accurate. And the they had crowns that were just way too European. The, the whole metal circlet thing, that's a European crown. That's not an Egyptian crown. Okay, to give you a demonstration, a couple of them here. Hang on. Okay, this is the false beard and the red crown of Lower Egypt. I made these when I was 12 with a yarn and crochet hook. Okay. And a little later, I made I made this Nemis headdress when I was in college, and then a few years later, I made, oh, check it out, a crook and flail. Now, I'm just one person, okay? I did this in my spare time. And um, by the way, that's why you don't see me in my vestments, because um, these are for prop purposes. These are, 
you know, um, maybe one day there'll be uh, costume pieces in a movie I get to make. But um, if I could do this in my spare time by myself, then a half dozen costume designers with a budget for Hancock Fabrics and maybe a trip to the hardware store, think of what they could do. They could do some real damage. And yet, you didn't see any of this in Gods of Egypt, in Exodus Gods and Kings. They were very half-hearted with their attempts. You know, there were a few costumes that looked kind of cool, but a lot of them that looked more handmade than anything I could have done. And all I have to say is, Hollywood prop people, step up your game. If I can sit here saying, eh, I could do better, you have a problem. Phew. Now, with that out of the way, let's get down to the plot. Or, what plot? <laughs> Alright, there was some in this movie, but they could have really paid more attention to mythology, and they, they missed a lot of opportunities with this. Um, and, uh, technically this will be some spoilers, but are you really worried about spoilers going to see this movie? So, one, Set kills Osiris. Why didn't he use the box trick from the, the Greek telling of the, the, the story? You know, oh, hey, who gets to fit in this human-sized casket? Osiris, step right up! Slam! They could have done that, but they didn't. Now, why didn't Set imprison Isis? Because that's referred to in the mythology. Oh, wait, in the movie, she kills herself? Uh, the cleverest, most resourceful goddess in Egyptian mythology kills herself? Bullshit. <laughs> that was something that just really, you, you took a major female element out of the story when, when they, they mentioned in passing that this had happened. I was just like, ugh. And you know what? There wouldn't have been any room for Sekhmet in this movie because she would have devoured everything. Now, Hathor did have a pretty good role in this movie. Um, unfortunately, she wouldn't have had anything to do with Set. Um, the interaction she had with him was completely contrived for this movie. And I was like, uh, uh okay. Again, they, they really missed an opportunity to uh, do more between Set and Neftis. And uh, they kind of kept that to a minimum, which was a bummer. But a blonde-headed Neftis? No. Heck, I, I think J-Lo would have made a better Neftis. Um, and, and I'm not saying that to mock J-Lo. I'm saying she would have done a better job than who they had. But uh, my biggest gripe about this movie and the plot of it, why does everything in Egypt have to revolve around the afterlife. What is this, the crow? Oh, never mind. You know, yes, the afterlife was a big part of the Egyptians' world because, hey, this was a pre-industrial society. People died, often. Um, and after a relatively short period of time compared to now. Um, but they had a lot more concerns than just that. And so it seems like too much of a gimme uh, when you have a movie and... Or, or anything with ancient Egypt and oh we're, it's all about the afterlife and you know uh, our sole objective is to gain passage into it or to make it free to everyone. Yes the worship of Osiris sort of democratized the afterlife for everyone when you look back at it historically but they weren't thinking that at the time. It's also like referring to a dynasty if you have characters in, in you know, an ancient Egyptian piece. Um, it's kind of an anachronism to have one pharaoh talking to his son about protecting the dynasty. Um, the dynasties were arranged by uh, an Egyptian priest under the Greeks many centuries later. So, uh, lots of anachronism there. As for the things that they kind of accidentally got right, uh, early on when you see a whole bunch of soldiers garbed in red uh, march in and their sets minions, you could say that those are the Mozu Badesh, or the Children of Rebellion. There are lots of references in uh, Egyptian texts, including things like the, the Cairo calendar, to uh, the Confederates of Set, and uh, they are typically hunted down and slaughtered by the other gods. So uh, that's you, you could say that we saw them um, in full CGI glory in Gods of Egypt. Another thing that they got right, um, this was intentional, but they still kind of goofed it a little. Hathor was indeed mistress of the West, but it was not when she was younger. 
Because when, when she refers to it that way, I'm going, you were young and needed the money, right, honey? Um, so, <laughs> you know, they, they uh, did borrow something that was real. They just kind of got strange with it. Um, now, the scenes with Ra on his solar bark, the, the, uh, the reviewers, most of them were like, what? You know, there's some weird spaceship thing. They didn't get it. I looked at it and I said, okay, I see what they're going for. Um, maybe if they'd have made it look more like a literal boat, it wouldn't have stumped so many people. I don't know. But what Ra tells Horace, when Horace goes to complain to him and says, hey, I need help, um, is right on. And, uh, the things that Ra says to Set later, um, asking him to, you know, uh, join him on, on the, the, the boat, you know, and battle Apophis every night, you know what, that's what Set does. And so they were going right on. Now what Set does afterwards is completely contrary to Egyptian Canaan, but hey, we didn't stick with Canaan earlier in this movie. Why start now? So <laughs> so they just kind of took it and went off into La La Land. Um, there's actually a lot of possibility if you look at Egyptian myths um, for some really interesting action movies. And you have some possibility for even some, some pathos and, and some human drama, um, human in the, the sense of feelings and characteristics, but you have to actually bother to crack open a book and read it and not get rid of important goddesses like Isis uh, in order to make a good story. So in sum, I would not recommend Gods of Egypt uh, to introduce anyone to Egyptian mythology. Uh, if you want a reasonably faithful pop culture depiction of the Egyptian pantheon, you're better off sticking with animation. Um, there was a series about 10 years ago called Tuttenstein um, that, uh, you know, did borrow from a few things like that. Um, even if you're intrepid enough to go and search the wilds of the internet, uh, look up the original G.I. Joe episode, The Gods Below. It sounds crazy, but you have the Joes and Cobra end up in the Hall of Two Truths. Um, <laughs> they even have Bajin in there. It's really cool. Um, after nearly 60 years, uh, The Ten Commandments is still the most visually accurate and most interesting Egyptian period flick. Um, Yul Brenner is just awesome all this time later. Um, Cleopatra is not too bad either. And um, considering that those movies are that old and all the stuff that we have with all the CG and whatever else that we can throw at it um, still doesn't top those, Hollywood, you need to step up your game. So for the Comedic How-To Guide, this is Sharon um, wishing you Cinebti and... Happy movie viewing.